Welch is kind of the predecessor of Macmillan Blodell. The Blodell name kind of resonates. He was the timberman, the, the lumberman from Seattle who was very involved in this. This guy was more a silent partner in that particular business, but he was involved in a lot of other things. Really quite a character, uh, one, of, one of the leading characters in Vancouver history and BC history through the 1930s. So to start with, this is an image of him in his full military regalia, General, Major General Jack Stewart. He was born in a small town in Scotland, Ned. And if you'll notice, the inset map, that's about as far up in the highlands as you can possibly go. This is really the middle of nowhere. And this is after the highland clearances and everything when they moved sheep in instead of crofters, farmers. There wasn't a heck of a lot to do. I mean, these are picturesque images of the landscape, but it was a good place to be from, a good place to get out of. And a lot of young men did fairly early. One of the things that Scotland still did have, even after the clearances, and that was a really good education system. So Jack Stewart was, was trained as an engineer. Uh, by 1882, he immigrated to Canada, as so many other Scots did. <clears throat> Let me see, there we go. And he hooked up with the CPR. This is just when the CPR was building as Transcontinental Railway. Big, big event employing a lot of people, a lot of contractors. And this is where it gets interesting. Rail contracting was sort of his lifeline, sort of what kept him going, his core business right through his career. <clears throat> Worked in a butcher shop, did a few other things, but then picked up as part of a CPR survey crew coming across the country. This is just an image of what the guys looked like, what the crew would be like at the period. He washed up eventually in the Vancouver town site, and most of you probably know that was all laid out, surveyed, developed by the CPR. Uh, that's why a lot of the names are CPR affiliated names, and that's Shaughnessy, for example. And he was involved with the laying out of the major town site, what is now downtown Vancouver. He was also there for the Great Fire in 1886. And this is one of the reasons people talked to him a fair bit later. After he had moved back to Vancouver about his experiences, there weren't that many people who were there when that had actually happened. Now, he went back up to Rogers Pass after his experience in Vancouver, still working for the CPR, it was quite developed. You can see how big the camp is there. It really is like a village that was set up in Rogers Pass. He, he uh, kept a, a fair bit of correspondence going at that point. What he wanted to do was save a stake, go back to Scotland. I think he was sweet on a girl back there. That was kind of the implication. But he had one of his Scottish pals in Vancouver doing his banking for him. You probably guess what happened. The, the friend in Vancouver took all his money he was left up there, he arrived in Vancouver with nothing, and, but he had good connections because he had been involved in the rail contracting for four or five years. He went down to the States, find his future down there. What had happened in the States is that they built their transcontinental rail line also, but then they were building a lot of branch lines in the 1880s, 1890s, and he got on with that. So, first of all, he was involved in the Great Northern. He got involved with one of the larger contracting companies. I got my aid memoir with some of the names here and that. So, early 1890s, he's involved working for D.C. Shepherd. And this is on the Great Northern Railway, the one that runs across or just south of the Canadian border. He then became the divisional engineer for a, a company called uh, Peter Larson. Later, um, uh, Shepard, Larson, and Henry, and they were also working on the Great Northern Line. Now, not only was he making contacts with all these people, these were mostly contractors out of the states, out of the Midwestern U.S., putting these lines across, but he married into the, into the firm. Uh, Peter Larson was one of the major contractors. He married his sister-in-law, Elizabeth Moran, uh, another young woman from the Midwest, and tied him into the whole thing. His lifelong partner, uh, Patrick Welch, married another sister, another Moran sister. So they're all kind of closing in, both professionally and family-wise. He then uh, became a partner for a company called Foley Brothers and Larson. This is still Peter Larson. Foley Brothers were out of Minnesota, and again, a construction firm, forestry firm, involved in rail construction. 
And what he seemed to take uh, responsibility for mostly was the development into the Kootenays. This is when the copper boom was happening in the Kootenays, and there was a lot of mining activity. So all the rail companies were putting in branch lines to get to the mines and get things out to trail, get things out to Eastern Canada. Very involved in that. He also, following that, moves back east. Remember, he's a partner in this company now, and he's supervising a lot of the twin tracking along Lake Superior and that stretch, and then the, the twin tracking going west to Winnipeg. So he's kind of moving up, he's becoming a partner, he's becoming, you know, assuming more responsibility as he goes along. They, in 1907, three of the partners in the company died. And a new company was, was formed, which was called Foley, Welch, and Stewart. Now his name's finally on the masthead. F, FWS is the company. And they became one of the dominant companies in the whole rail boom. Now, this was the industry at that time. There were rail lines going in everywhere. This is the, the economic boom just before World War I. It's the second industrial revolution. Everybody wants wheat from the prairies. Everybody wants base minerals from the Kootenays or places like that. Everything, and lumber from the, the coast is starting to be shipped back east. So there's all these rail lines going in. This firm became one of the dominant players in the whole thing. So in, at one point they had contracts for over 2,000 miles of line, were employing over 50,000 men. A uh, huge, huge organization at that time. The, just to give you an idea of the, the profits involved in this, think, think about the, uh, the 2,000 miles of line. The estimated price on the Grand Trunk Pacific line, and the company basically did all of that from Winnipeg to Prince Rupert, was $112,000 a mile. And we're talking 1911, 1912 dollars. So huge, huge profit margin. They were a very harsh employer. They were described at the time, well, the, the, the term that was used was Fulham, Workham, and Starham for FWNS, right? Uh, there were ruder versions also. The, the unions were after them. There was one of the big unions at the time was called the Wobblies, the IWW, International Workers of the World, at, or Industrial Workers of the World, sorry. And they, they kind of targeted them in particular because they were such mean employers. But they made a lot of money. You know, this, this is really the bucks rolling in in that sort of boom period. Um, a lot of spectacular developments. The Connaught Tunnel was the longest tunnel in the world at the time, just over five miles. And they worked it out so they punched it through the mountain in both directions. It did meet up. It all worked out just the way it should. Really a, a fairly spectacular venture. Just to give you a, a sense again of the, the scope of this all, you have these camps moving to the west. Now, they were running a lot of the construction themselves. They were also contracted out. And in some cases, you'd subcontract out like just a mile or two, literally, to a local contract firm if it was something you didn't like to do. So it, you kind of got this, this pyramid of contractors, but they were kind of the dominant one in this period in Canada. They were also active in the States, but the, um, the Grand Trunk Pacific, the CPR uh, uh, twin tracking was really what there was driving their economy at that time. A lot of mechanization, think about the capital involved in this, when you have these kinds of modern machines, modern for 1914, machines involved in this, this task. You also, as I mentioned, have a huge workforce too, and these are the uh, the, the navvies, uh, the, the guys that were just laying the track, hammering the spikes, putting down the ties, etc. in the Prince George area. This is again all part of the Grand Trunk Pacific project. Here's where we start to get a bit of synergy going on. So this is getting into the Bloedel Stewart and Welch era. Two things happened. They're making a lot of money but they, they are looking to diversify a little bit, make even more. And again, this is driven mostly by Stewart and Welch, those two partners, those two brothers-in-law, who remain partners right up until Welch's death in 1928. They get in touch with Julius Blodell, a lumberman in, in Seattle. He had already been involved with Peter Larson and some of the earlier contractors as a supplier of rail ties and building materials and so forth had contracts with them. So part of, part of that group, part of that sort of club of uh, construction people, 
They approach him. He says, okay, well, we'll form a company. 1911, they formed Bloedel, Stewart & Welch. It's incorporated. They buy up a whole lot of timber lands in British Columbia, and they've got built-in contracts for everything. Remember, the biggest rail contracting company in, in the nation. So they immediately have contracts for, what was it, 40 million feet or 1,800 carloads of lumber. Uh, just going to the Grand Trunk Pacific. At the same time, we'll talk about this more in a, in a couple of minutes, they formed the Pacific Great Eastern Railway. This is the one that later became BC Rail, running from North Van up to Prince George. And, and this was uh, Foley, Stewart and Welch's venture into, into uh, rail ownership rather than just contracting. They also got the contract for all the wood for that development. So all this kicks off in 1911, 1912. They set up initially at Myrtle Point. This is just south of Powell River. They, they got timber limits there. It turned into a big, big production. Uh, all the, the most modern equipment, again, these are all brand new Shea locomotives. Uh, the one right in the front, the number one here, is the one that you uh, see by the highway at the Forest Museum in Duncan now. So they're still around some of them. A number of them actually are still around. It turns into a fairly massive company. And obviously I'm short circuiting a lot of this to try and squeeze it into 22 minutes or maybe 25 minutes. This is just some of the action going there. Then they moved to the island. Uh, they initially moved into the area around Campbell River more, moved some plants and, and uh, operations there, but then had their eye on the Alberti Valley a little bit. So in 1925, they formed a partnership with a company called King Ferris Lumber, which was already active in Greater Vancouver with mills and things, and they constructed the Great Central Sawmill. The Great Central Mill was made possible because the rail track had finally gone in. Nothing to do with them, this was different uh, contractors, but the ENN line went to Great Central. So the first batch of lumber cut at Great Central was shipped out to Quebec. It made it possible to export to Canada, and that's why they got involved. They eventually bought out their partners, and, but this became a, a major production mill. What's kind of cool is that this is a postcard from the 1930s, and you can see that's kind of how they're promoting the Alberni Valley, right, as these big Bloedel, Stewart, and Welch operations. That's shortly after it was built, 1928, 1925 is when it was put in. The, uh, the sort of village was established as part of that, and again, you can see large amounts being cut, lots of uh, timber rights around Great Central at that point. And this is a, an early image of the Bloedel, Stewart and Welch mill down on the waterfront. This is what became the SOMAS eventually, morphed into the SOMAS. This is actually probably a little bit later than it's labeled because it is already actively cutting. It was built in 1934-35. These panoramas were shot just after it started operation. It started operation in February of 35 and was considered the biggest sawmill in the British Empire at the time. So part of the thing, part of the reason that this guy is important to the area is because it was the dominant, kind of megalithic lumber company, even before Macmillan Blodell. Typically it'd be fairly small operations with a few timber uh, limits and with a small mill. This was a big export directed mill that was set up you can see some familiar elements here. You see the train station here still. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of, of how things are organized in the town at that period and how dominant this mill was. Now, the other thing you required was a timber supply, what we call a fiber supply. <coughs> and Franklin River was put in as a major logging camp to supply the big Bloedel, Stewart & Welch mill in Port Alberni. It was also, at the same time, the biggest logging camp in the British Empire. So again, really a dominant feature of the landscape. This is shortly after the, the second camp was installed, uh, up, up uh, in the mountains a little bit. You can get a sense of the size of it. And a lot of people locally have some experience or connection to Franklin River. They didn't spare the ponies. Because they were a big corporate organization, 
they could bring in the latest technology. So the Lidgerwood skidders that they brought in, massive, massive steel spar skidders. They could increase production because of that. They could expand production into areas not otherwise accessible using skyline systems. Still using rail to get everything out to the water. They were also pioneers in using chainsaws, using power saws. It started in the very late 1930s. Almost everybody was still using just axes and hand-powered cross-cut saws at that time. So a lot of innovation. And this is, again, part of what let them become more and more dominant in the sector. OK, the, with, with what was happening locally, it was reflected mostly just in the forest industry again. Uh, our, our hero, Jack Stewart, was the vice president of, of Bloedel Stewart & Welch in the sort of 1920s period. In 1928, his partner, Patrick Welch, died, and he bought all his shares, acquired all his shares. He was kind of a dominant shareholder, but then was just kind of a silent partner after that through his death in 1938. However, he got involved in this whole venture also with Welch. This is the Pacific Great Eastern, later BC Rail venture. The premier at the time was a guy called um, um, McBride, uh, Richard McBride, and he was very pro-development. Did a sweetheart deal, because this was the big rail contracting company. He said, well, you know, how would you guys like to build a railway? We could really use another line from Burrard Inlet up to Prince George. Sweetheart deal, nobody else got to bid on it, nobody else got to even be considered about it. They formed another partnership for this company, and again, this was Stuart and Welch at the sort of center of the whole thing. It was a difficult, difficult construction uh, exercise. You know, getting up through that whole corridor became very difficult. Uh, but they had lots of experience in it. Just to give you an idea of the extent, Inaugural run to Lillooet in 1915. About half of the line that they had to Lillooet, they bought from another existing rail company already, but they were continuing construction. However, it was all a little shady. They found out that later, when they were doing kind of the post-mortem on this, the audit on it, uh, under the direction of the provincial government, this is the select commission that was investigating irregularities with the PGE line. They had about $5.7 million, and again, remember, this is 1914-1915 dollars that had been overspent on construction to themselves. Um, Stewart wasn't involved in the construction side, but a subsidiary company called Patrick Welch and Company did do all the construction. So they paid themselves an extra $5.7 million to do this stuff. There were a number of other irregularities identified as part of this. Eventually, the provincial government stepped in and said, well, this, this has to stop. They seized the whole thing, basically. They, um, uh, just to con confirm some of the numbers here, they seized all the property of the PGE. This was valued at about $22.5 million. So the province seized all that. They also asked for an additional $1.1 million in compensation. Our hero, Stewart, had to pay about $650,000 of that. Welch had to pay about two fifty. dollars So obviously, they were culpable in all this shaky stuff. At the same time, though, our hero is becoming a military hero. So he's kind of untouchable. Oh, there's one other thing that goes along with this that's kind of cool. He bought a newspaper. Have any of you heard of the Vancouver Sun? Uh, he bought the Vancouver Sun strictly to promote his involvement in the PGE and lobby for the PGE. However, when they all took off, so, so when all this started to happen, Patrick Welch ran to, to, uh, to Seattle, never came back to, the, to Canada after that. So you got another sort of absent owner of Bloedel Stewart and Welch. His uh, other partner, uh, McLeod, ended up going to Minnesota, never came back to Canada. Stewart was kind of untouchable, again, because of this whole military thing and that. But they put the newspaper into the name of one of his secretaries, and the secretary wouldn't give it back to him after. Uh, so they kind of got caught out, you know, trying to hide their assets in different ways. So Stewart was a little bit tricky, and he got caught out in that particular instance. Here he is being a military hero. So here he is with a couple of other generals. 
He actually shipped off eventually in 1917 to Europe. He, he was involved with something called the Canadian Railway Troops. These were formed up initially in 1915. 500 guys went, another 1,000 the following year. Eventually, Stewart had about 16,000 men working for him in the Canadian Railway Troops. And what, what's interesting is the World War I was the first war where technology became really, really important. This was a way that you could bring material, troops, uh, weapons, whatever, to the front and bring the injured people back. Uh, just, just running logistics in a way that hadn't been possible before. A lot of this stuff is available from the National Archives of Canada now. This is a page from the headquarters thing here. We've got our hero, Brigadier General J.W. Stewart, arriving at headquarters. He, he was a big wheel in this whole thing. He eventually got kicked upstairs a couple of times until he was the Deputy Director of Light Railways in France. This is kind of the network that they had. The, and, and this is diagrammatic, right? Back at the base, getting out to the front eventually. The other images are maybe more dramatic. This is the kind of stuff they were working with. A lot of it was narrow gauge railway. These were mostly ex-CPR or ex-Foley uh, Welch and Stewart um, workers who were taken over there as part of the Canadian Railway troop. This kind of thing, this is astonishing. And they built this thing in seven days. Uh, a 600 foot long trestle with a massive amount of wood in it. Really remarkable what they did accomplish. And a lot of people feel it was critical to the war effort to, to make the Allies uh, win the war. Ammunition, imagine loading all these boxcars with ammunition shells to go to the front in those circumstances. This is one of my favorite images, the tanks being taken. So this is what the tanks of the day looked like. They were getting them out to the front, apparently did win this engagement as a result of this. And this is all written up in the trade journal. This is the Canadian Railway and Marine World magazine. So these guys are being written up as being sort of stars in their field all through this. Comes back to Canada in 1919, he's mustered out. He was given a, a number of points of recognition, uh, distinguished service. Uh, order, made a companion of the Order of the Bath. Now that's just one step below being knighted. It's kind of recognition by the, the royal family and that you're something special. And he started doing more contracting, construction contracting, public works, things like that. This, this one is kind of interesting. The Takarati Port project was a big one that failed miserably. It's in what is now Ghana, uh, West Africa. And the deal was to put in a rail line that would run out to the, the coast, as well as putting in a harbor so they could ship out the, the products that would be produced by the Gold Coast to Britain primarily. It was a $21 million project, which was massive at that time. They got it, Stuart McDonald, this was the guy who was the colonel just under him in World War I. This was all lobbying through the British military and that, the British establishment. They got the contract, they failed miserably, were booted out in 1924. But this part of the story doesn't get talked about that much. Another bigger British firm took it over from them. Got involved in a lot of public works type activity. On Burrard Inlet, the, the second Narrows uh, rail bridge, tunnel under Burrard Inlet, uh, the CPR tunnel that goes under the city still today, they built all this stuff. And it was often uh, J.W. Stewart and Company and Northern Construction was his new set of partners. So it, he remained very active, involved in rail construction, involved in this sort of public works thing in different combinations with his old pals and on his own. He also became very wealthy out of this, all these ventures. So obviously the rail contracting made him a lot of money. All the other things too. In 1912, he was back in Britain, 1912, 1913. What's the first thing a really rich guy does? Well, you buy yourself a Rolls Royce, right? And he kept this through the 1920s. It's apparently still in existence in Ohio someplace. And that's him driving in this case. When he was back in Britain, he also bought his whole home parish. Remember, this was a young guy that had gone from Ned in 1882, born there in 1862. So he bought the whole, uh, and it, it, 
different things. This, uh, the number I've cited here is 60,000. There's another one that says 134,000 acres. He, he bought the whole shooting match. He became the laird of the parish, this young crofter's son that was sent off to Canada uh, 20 years before, 30 years before, I guess, at that point, which is pretty remarkable. Eventually, he sold it off. He rented this out like the local, uh, the local farmers and everything would rent from him as the landlord. It looks like he wasn't making that much money out of that by the 1920s. Put it up for, uh, for um, collateral when he was taking out loans, probably when he set up the Great Central uh, uh, Sawmill, actually. He used this as collateral. Then sold it all off in 1936 at the height of the Depression for about half of what he had paid for it originally. But for that period of time, like for 20-some years, he was the guy in his home. You know, it would be like somebody here buying the whole Alberta Valley, basically. Mm -hmm. That would be sort of the equivalent. He also got a cool house in Shaughnessy, Carl Ardvar, sometimes called the Roses, you can see all the roses in the gardens. And it was kind of a hub of social activity in the city of Vancouver. He was a member of that kind of Scottish elite group. There were a lot of very wealthy people of Scottish extraction around Vancouver. Another one who was involved in this area was uh, A.D. McRae. Uh, who was involved with, with Fraser Mills and with uh, later with uh, BC Packers. But it was kind of a hub of activity. So when somebody from the royal family came, when the Duke of York came or whatever, he would visit with this guy. He was also the senior, oh, this is part of his Scottish thing again, the Caledonian Games. Here's our hero. And this is during World War I, when he's involved in all these criminal things and everything, but there he is kind of being the, the head Scotsman in Vancouver at the same time, giving out the prizes, all the silverware and so forth, at the Caledonian Games. So he was very proud of that. That heritage piece was part of it. Here he is in his official function as Major General Stewart. He was the the senior military officer in Vancouver at the time. So whenever there was some kind of official event, reviewing of the troops, ceremonial things, he would be dragged up for that. This is quite late on, obviously, the, the coronation of King George VI, just a year before Stuart died in September of 38. And here's his old funeral in, in uh, September of 38. He was always affiliated with the, with the um, Seaforth Highlanders. He had been an honorary colonel before World War I. He stayed involved with them, and again, full of military honors and everything as part of this. The, the sad part of this story is his wife had died a couple of years previously, in about 1936, I believe. And what might have triggered, I don't know if this triggered or not, he died of a heart attack. They had one daughter, Margaret, who had one son. Uh, and his son-in-law, Stuart's son-in-law, worked for the family firm, you know, on construction and so forth. Another Scott, expat Scott. His daughter died, and her, his grandson died, uh, just a couple of months before this. They were driving across the Granville Street Bridge and drove off into Burrard Inlet and died in the crash, drowned in the crash. The, there was suspicion that it might have been suicide at the time, that she was depressed and so forth. Uh, I don't think a, a firm answer ever came out of it, but there was some question about it. That might have been part of what triggered Stuart just packing it eventually in the end. So a bit of a sad end out of the whole thing. Punchline out of all this stuff, I think I've kept well, just a little bit long, but not bad, is that he, he was kind of used as a classic example of a self-made man. This is one of the things that they used at the time to sort of say why you should immigrate, why you should work hard, how you would get ahead, how you become a wealthy, high prestige person by doing that. He was kind of a classic example of that. He was part of that whole Scottish diaspora of that period too, people that came out to Canada to make their futures that way. He was a war hero. He was a millionaire. Uh, he did all the right things. He had these couple of massive failures, and these kind of shaky dealings with the PG and everything. One of the things I find interesting is when he died, all that was kind of brushed under the carpet. It was kind of the positives. 
Locally, massive impact, Lodell Stewart and Welch, by being the dominant sector defining forestry company, really shaped a lot of things in the Alberni Valley. You know, that idea of a massive meltdown on the waterfront, the idea of the big logging camps that fed these mills, really kind of changed the landscape and set the tone for what happened in the McMillan Bodell era. And most of you are probably familiar or lived here during that. You know, it was a company town very much. And it was, it was much the same under Bodell, Stewart, and Welch all those years before. We just don't think about it as much. And with that, I'll end it. Thank you. <laughs> On behalf of the club, I thank you very much for a great presentation. Oh, thanks. Being an ex-Harry Ass BC logger, oh, I did appreciate oh, uh, Rickman and Bodell at the time. Good See, income was made for the Valley. Yeah, 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 it was. So, and same thing earlier. You know, that it's really what drove it. Oh, it's big time. Right through the depression. Yes. Anyway, on behalf of the club, thanks again. Uh, really I really appreciate it. Thanks very much.